Welcome to another episode of the Gestalt Education Show. So uh, you're in for a good one today. We sat down with Craig Morris. So uh, Craig is, you know, Brett maybe spent more time with Dr. Yonda than anybody else in this world, uh, in, in the United States that's still alive, I'll put it that way. Uh, I, I learned a ton about the history of not only the Prague School, Dr. Yonda, uh, what it what life was in, in Prague in, in, you know, the 90s and stuff like that. And so, uh, you know, you've known Craig for quite a while. Uh, what would you take from the conversation? Yeah, Craig and I have over the years definitely shared a, a fondness for history in general. But he really uh, he understands like chiropractic history really well, the Prague School history, and I think his time with Yanda, uh, specifically Yanda, but also Levitt. I think like that blend, um, a lot of the stuff I didn't know or hadn't heard before. So it's really refreshing to kind of you know hear their perspective. Is you know the Prague School is. You know, now we're around the, you know, the master, you know, Dr. Kolosh, who's just so talented, but then kind of see bits and pieces of the Prague school before there was Pavel. And I think like those are, there's still some important points there. And I think he did a really good job of uh, exposing those and talking about what those are. Uh, we talked about, you know, things, you know, when we still might use a wobble board, balance sandals, the the benefit of a good postural evaluation you know is it still important to look at gait all these things that we know to be true but you know all that's back at yonda basically so mm -hmm. i think like you know it, hearing that again just always is awesome for me so that's absolutely i think things we're contemplating as far as the model goes uh maybe some of yonda stuff we have maybe educated a little bit more or got risen a little bit more up. I, I, I'm still kind of, uh, yeah, thinking about the, the postural exams, upper, lower cross, stuff like that. So I think like the assessment and then the thought process on the muscle synergies and things like that would still be dead true today. I just think that, you know, with DNS, it's like we kind of have a different tool. Uh, I would also just maybe in conclusion say that I think Craig wrote a very underrated book that a lot of people don't know about. Uh, we also talked with Craig Liebenson on this trip, and I, I mean, he obviously has written a, good, a great book also. Mm -hmm. um, but Craig's book is different than uh, Craig Liebenson's book, and uh, I think like, there's, there's, some good, there's some good material in there, some really good material. So I think like talking about that again uh, always makes me excited to maybe go back and look at a chapter or two in, in that book also. So Absolutely. All right, guys, enjoy this conversation with Craig Morris. All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of the Gestalt Education Show. Uh, I'm Taylor Primer here with my co-host, Brett Winchester. Today we are sitting down with uh, a DNS international instructor, uh, one of the original OGs from the, the first group that went to Prague, first or second group, uh, maybe the person that has spent more time with uh, Dr. Yonda than anybody else in the United States right now, and that's uh, Dr. Craig Morris. And so um, I, I'm delighted to sit down and, and kind of get into some, some uh, for me, I'm interested in, in your years of experience with Yonda and your your clinical experience and um, I know you and Brad have been good friends for a long time but uh, we were here in LA at, at the clinic and it's a beautiful clinic and uh, we just thank you for sitting down with us so my pleasure we had a good uh, good dinner with uh, with Len the other a couple of week days ago and uh, uh, learned a lot you, you pulled out some amazing books from the library some classics Craig. holy cow so um, that, what, a, what a cool thing to have uh, some, some really old school books that are just like really awesome the kind of the or origins of manual therapy if you will and so um, has history always been in something that you've been interested in or like how how did that all kind of come about that you started collecting textbooks and books and I think it all goes back to the fact that I was originally a journalist mm. and so and so I liked being investigative so I was a, a journalist in high school and then uh, my early years at the university and so I liked to, to write and I liked to do the the stories where I could stick my teeth in and dig in deeper mm. And so, and then when I got in practice, I wasn't interested in only what we were doing. I really wanted to know what all the pro other professions did with regard to musculoskeletal disorders or neuromusculoskeletal disorders. And so I'd just search the um, local people and I'd start reading and I'd just get books and I'd uh, talk to the local surgeons and uh, neurologists, anybody that would put up with me. Yeah. And I just I take them to lunch. I take them to dinner, and I get to know them. If my patients were going to have surgery, then it was a requirement that I would be allowed to go in and observe the surgeries. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was all part of my continuing education to figure out how to best uh, service uh, my patients and how to integrate with the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. Unfortunately, 
uh, my generation, uh, of course Taylor's generation, no one has been able to meet Vladimir Yanda or be around him. So can you kind of uh, explain some of the things that made him so special, why he was so talented, his background, how it influenced you? Yeah, well, Vlad was um, absolutely genius, but he was more than that. He, it was his character. Uh, he would always say, because he was uh, he had polio, struck down with polio when he was about 13 or 14, um, he would always say that for me everything's harder, even for me to walk across the room it's five times more work for me than it is for most people. So I've always gotten used to having to work harder to get anything done. So that helped uh, to uh, influence his character. So he was, before World War II, he was in uh, living in Bohemia with his family, got uh, struck down with polio, who was a quadriplegic for a time, and then para paraplegic. He was in an iron lung for a time. And um, he finally regained the ability to, uh, to walk, but he was always left with uh, uh, a very faulty gait and he lost all control of his abdominal musculature. Mm -hmm. So he had a protruding stomach always. If you'd hear him cough, his best cough was like <laughs> and so um, so he had to work around that. And um, then the, he was heavily influenced um, after the war was over, he was heavily influenced by the work of Sister Kinney, who we spoke about a little bit, Elizabeth Kinney, who I um, was really critical in using manual therapy techniques to um, to restore uh, polio patients. Mm -hmm. And um, she ended up having a global impact, in fact, and impacted you know, Europeans. And she was brought to Prague as a, and, uh, as a lecturer, invited to lecture. And Yanda was a medical student. And when he, um, uh, because he spoke English, he had, he had learned to speak English, he served as her translator. And he was so inspired by her work that he stopped his medical studies for a time and studied her work and became essentially a kinney therapist. Mm -hmm. So as he went by in his later years, he would generally tell people that he was a very confused man. He, was, he says, I don't know if I'm a neurologist or a physiatrist. I don't know if I'm a physical therapist or a chiropractor. I'm some blend of all of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, wow. um, and in fact, he was. Mm -hmm. Well, he's kind of, you know, known as being a, a savant at observation. So he's kind of known for his gait evaluation, taking the time to do a good uh, postural examination. Uh, can you comment on those two things? Like what made him so good at, at observation? And well, you know, uh, you, uh, I think everybody has heard of people who have lost some sort of their, some sense. Uh, and as a result, they've then had greater acuity in their remaining senses. Mm -hmm. So because he was wheelchair bound for so many years, he became uh, observant, hyper observant in listening, but especially in his observation. So he would, he would, we would have courses. Uh, somebody would be uh, maybe in the middle of his lecture would uh, be in the front and they'd get up to walk out the room and he would stop and he says, by the way, do you realize that you have a short leg on the right side? <laughs> um, just as they took and when I would study with him, when we would travel and I would assist him in his courses and then I would, and I would go back to Prague to study with him, um, we would play a game and especially at the airports and then it was I needed to be able to tell him what the patients what the person's problem was as they walked past us in the in the airport and I had three steps to tell him the, the, the patient's history and so he was um, he was a tough mentor um, and, but at the same time if um, you know and he, if he, he liked you he teased you he liked me a lot obviously because he teased me a lot <laughs> but but um, at the end I got so I was very comfortable in three four steps I could give him a pretty good explanation of what I saw what was going on so it was a great opportunity to learn and um, um, as they say you know the, the, uh, there's a an old quote uh, Problem with you is like the problem with me. We got, I've got, we got two good eyes and still can't see. <laughs> and so it's one thing to look; it's another to see. So he helped me to integrate the visual and what I talk about in my low back textbook is uh, visual clinical literacy. What he taught me, and what a term I like to use and teach with is visual clinical literacy. Because it's one thing to be able to look at it; it's another thing to be able to observe the faults. It's another to be able to clinically integrate it, just like if you're reading a book. 
I mean, if you you can, we can all see the letters. I can I can see the letters in Japanese or Chinese, but I can't interpret what their meaning. And the idea of visual clinical literacy is interpreting the meaning of what it is you're seeing. Hmm. Couldn't help but notice you got some uh, wobble sandals over there. So yeah, yeah. he's kind of given credit for you know starting the whole sensory motor, the wobble board movement, the wobble sandals, yep. sensory motor training. Yes. You know, it seems like with, you know, you and I are both DNS instructors, sometimes I feel like some of that gets forgotten about. But uh, maybe could you explain where, like, the young clinician may still be integrating uh, the sensory motor training into, into a case? Well, now we have good research. We were talking the other night uh, about the fact that we know now that we can, that altered motor patterns occur with um, faults, with following injury or following um, uh, prolonged use of, of poor patterns, too much sitting, uh, playing in sports where it's asymmetrical movement patterns. And these end up putting, causing alterations in our motor patterns. <laughs> and so we know now that anybody that has any kind of chronicity has compromised in their movement patterns and this has now been measured on the motor cortex and corrective exercises can correct that. So we know now that, <clears throat> that um, we must integrate corrective exercises as part of our strategy if we're looking for long-term results and more effective results. And he was, Yanda was the one who really put this together. And a lot of the exercises and treatments that we use are sensory motor exercises and sensory motor training. Would you say you utilize those <laughs> once a day, once an hour, once a week, once a month? For, your for the person. You mean should the patient integrate them? Because I yeah. I have those, I I use those and I sell those. I have them and my patients buy them and they use them at home. So I try to use those. It just depends on the cases. Sure. But I generally use those for my athletes and my patients who are really interested in not just getting out of pain, but they're looking to either take full responsibility, um, but uh, for the, for their health, but especially my athletes that are mm -hmm. looking to improve their function because. The, the balance, his balance sandals are, you know, he, he introduced those because he was frustrated that the other sensory motor uh, devices, um, such as uh, rocker board and wobbler, are only for stance. But he wanted something that was used for gait. And so he took the same sandals that the clinicians in Central Europe use, uh, walking in the hospitals and all of that, and put, uh, you know, hard half rubber ball on the bottom. And so that, and then they did uh, the research on them. And there's a, a great paper they showed he did with um, uh, out of Australia, with John 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 Bullock's acid, mm -hmm. thanks, um, that showed that they increased and improved overall pelvic uh, stability and activation through the kinetic chain. And then there was a second paper in the Journal of Athletic Training that came out. And that one showed that they were more effective for lower extremity stabilization um, than any of the other co comparable exercises that were commonly used. Mm -hmm. So they're extremely good for the lower extremity. Uh, if you want looking for isolated, like a post um, ankle trauma, uh, leg trauma, fractures, foot, and they're uh, from an isolated standpoint. But at the same time, it's a, you have a global impact with the balance sandals. Yeah, we try to get our listeners to really look globally, treat the whole kinematic system. And and their work actually exposed the fact that after an inversion ankle sprain, there's inhibition on the glute on that same side. Yes. So yes. We, th we theorize it, but it's always good to see the research that, that is there the, to make us want to do that. Because I think for a lot of our listeners, it's just so easy on an inversion ankle sprain to do all local treatment and not understand like the whole kinetic chain. Mm -hmm. And I think, and that paper with uh, Jan and uh, Bill Saxon, when you said, we showed that the ankle sprains, there was inhibition of the glutes, but that means you must look centrally, look at the bigger picture. The problem was not the glutes, and the problem, there was a long, long, long healed uh, sprains that they use. The change was in the motor cortex, and this was helping to support uh, Yonda's theories before we had the technology to support, confirm the fact that there were changes on the motor cortex. Mm -hmm. But and that the, that with exercises it changes back. We can measure the changes on the motor cortex uh, with corrective exercises, and those changes go move back to the original 
place on the motor cortex. That means if you had your controls patients check their movement patterns and what they would initiate on the motor cortex, these chronic patients with corrective exercises, it moved back on the motor cortex to the same initiation point. Mm -hmm. That's really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really. Uh, they're making a resurgence on the PGA Tour. Kevin Kisner, do you know the name? He's in, yeah. he's, there's lots of videos of him practice putting with him uh, on the putting green. And uh, so it's, he, he, and they asked him about it, and it, he, he feels like his balance with his putting is so much better well, than I, he does. I, I, was, I, put him on, I started using him on the PGA Tour in 2010. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was working with, especially with Robert Carlson. Mm -hmm. Now he's, um, he's co-captain for the upcoming yeah. um, Ryder Cup. Yeah. And uh, so I, was, I, I had uh, all of our players that we worked with were actually had the balance in. Yeah, so it's yeah. nice to hear that it's still being yeah, continued. Yeah, it's, it's still rolling on. Nice. So, yeah. There might not be a better person than you, Craig, to kind of talk about the continuum of the Prague School. Can you kind of talk about the transition from Levitt, Yanda, Voita, as it's transitioned now into Pavel and, and DNS and, right. and well, how that's all transpired? So the Prague School, really the idea was initiated by Carl Levitt in Paris in World War II when he was uh, driving a tank uh, for the Allies in World War II as they were, had moved back into Europe. And uh, while he had time in Paris, I'm off, he was, went to their medical library and started looking and found out that there was a manual medicine school in the 19th century in Paris and that was heavily influenced by uh, exercise and posture and movement. And so as a result, he had that, he had, that formed the initial idea, the initial concept. And then when he, um, and this is from him, what he was tell, telling me when I would go visit with him. And so, and then uh, when he got the opportunity later on, uh, when he was a physician, he was a neurologist, and he had a Professor Henner who was, um, he was really, uh, had a lot of authority and was himself kind of a celebrity in Czechoslovakia as a physician at that time, and he had the clout to, to promote a new uh, approach to rehabilitation and a new model. And so because of, with Professor Henner's support, then, then Levitt initiated the school in the mm -hmm. 50s. And then years later, he met with Yanda, and they first met at a chiropractor's office. That was there was a lady who was a chiropractor in Prague who said she had studied with B.J. Palmer, and Yanda knew her already because his father had taken him to her when he was a boy, a teenager, uh, to see if it would help with his pol post polio, and so two different schools had been instructed by the government to check if this chiropractor was safe or what she was doing and should they allow it to continue. So he goes there and he was from one school and Levitt was from another school and they met at this chiropractor's office to study her. She would not explain what she was doing or why she was doing it, but she would allow them to observe because you know, she was uh, bound ethically at that time to hold chiropractic secrets within, within the profession of how, what, how we assess and how we treat it. And, um, so, but they were bright and they figured out a lot on their own. Mm -hmm. But so, actually, the Prague School, uh, as far as the, the meeting of the minds and the, then the, the, the uh, collaboration between Jan and Levitt, initially initiated in a chiropractor's office. Wow. That's insane. I mean, we, we have our opinion. How did all of these just icons come from the same hospital in the same area? What? Were they were they pushing each other? What's uh, how how did how exactly did that happen? Well, I know I think part of it <clears throat> uh, has to do with um, the way that they were taught back then. It was extremely rigorous study. So Yonda, for example, when he was an in intern working in the clinics, he would have his own patients, and every time a patient died, he was required to go down and observe the autopsy. So, so the scrutiny, and the, he talked about how tough it was, the mentors. He talked about his mentor, Professor Henner, would go and they'd do rounds, and he would ask him, he was a very uh, proper gentleman, hmm. Professor Henner, but, and so he would say that he would, he would have a patient, and they were doing rounds, and Dr. Yonda would then give his explanation of what this patient, and the patient's there laying in their bed listening, and he'd say, I found this and this, and this is my differential diagnosis, and this is my diagnosis, and this is my treatment plan, and he said, uh, well, that's very interesting. P Professor Henner said, that's very interesting, Dr. Yonda. Um, um, are there any other potential um, diagnoses and approaches you might take. And 
he said he said it so nicely that the person that didn't in the in the bed didn't realize that what the rest of us understood, which meant he just called me an idiot, <laughs> <laughs> and that he that I totally blown it. He said, and I would immediately start sweating. We all did, Be, and so you know it's interesting. But you see, you know we're used to seeing the Yanda, this great mind, this genius, and now more and more called the father of rehabilitation around the world. But you know, so it's interesting when all of a sudden, when you we would have. Uh, he and I would have a lot of drinks over a lot of scotch and talk about these kinds of things, yeah. you know. And then all of a sudden, you see him as a young man and as a young student and going through his own uh, travails and his own challenges, and from his mentors. And I think that that, to me, that really, you know, helped to humanize him. But then that what, what helped me a lot was how he ended up gaining his ideas to promote his upper cross, his cross syndromes, and his other. Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, observations. Mm -hmm. yeah, well. And it's kind of, you know, you think of it like of two different time er eras, basically, but uh, with collage mesmerizing all of us, it like just being, you know, the, the gift that he is, are we in danger of DNS overshadowing some of like Yonda and Levitt's work that, or no? I think that's, I think it's a great question. It is a blend. Uh, DNS it takes from all three, mm -hmm. but there are still um, aspects. Certainly, for example, DNS uh, and, and Pavel has said that you know you know you need to normalize the tissues, um, and then and get the patients out of pain. Mm -hmm. Our exercises are then then we apply our exercises for DNS. DNS is not for acute pain. So, in the end, that means it's still an open game. And Pavel's perspective is: I don't care how you normalize it; you normalize it. Mm. So, but Yanda, uh, both um, Voita's work was is good um, for uh, pain reduction of pain; it's effective. And then uh, Levitt's work, his manual techniques are brilliant, and they were integration integrative, based upon the work. We, uh, Prague School looked at the chiropractic approaches, the osteopathic approaches, the um, um, uh, oriental medicine approaches, and um, and and so they McKinsey they integrated everything. They looked, but they looked at everything from a neurological perspective because that's what's unique about the Prague School. Really unique is that they were a rehabilitation medical uh, university based rehabilitation department organized by neurologists. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, that's the only program like that. The rest is based on orthopedics and, and biomechanics. Mm -hmm. And this is what their great contribution has been what allowed them because they were looking from a totally different perspective. Yeah. We're, uh, right, we're right on the edge here of Redondo Beach, which is fascinating because the first time I ever saw a collage was you had hosted um, him and a couple of of the other physios in Redondo Beach there. Mm -hmm. So that was my first exposure. So, and I, I mean, looking back at the course, I mean, it was basically three or four days of only reflex locomotion. So uh, DNS has obviously evolved into its own thing. And uh, right. could you maybe talk about that evolution from the reflex locomotion model as it is now with uh, DNS Exercise. Well, I think you have to. It's, it's a great question. I, th I uh, intriguing question. I think you have to go back and understand how Voita came up with his initial concepts because he was looking to help children with cerebral palsy. And what he really uh, realized that because um, that the neural facilitation has to do with the combination of joint positions and the tensions within the body and the all the mechanoreceptors. So it's, I always talked about reflex locomotion being like um, uh, unlo uh, un undoing a lock that had uh, millions of tumblers and you had to have this really long, long, long key to get in position. And so when we were working with reflex stimulation, we were putting the patient in positions and then we we're using some contact points that were neurofacilatory. But the fact is that by putting the patients in centrated positions, then you're, it is neurofacilatory in itself. And I think this is a critical uh, aspect of what it is we're doing. We are taking, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of the, the concepts that Voiti used and essentially with the, the, uh, the concept of centration, 
um, we are we are doing exercises and movement patterns with repetition uh, in a neurofacilitary way because of the centrated pattern. So um, I mentioned we had our, uh, our integrated congress in 2019, 2K19 congress, and I mentioned that people like to say the the, the saying perfect uh, practice makes perfect, but um, Vince Lombardi. Uh, the great Packers coach said, pra uh, "Practice does not make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect." And so, what we when we put this th our discussion together, what with, with centration, we're getting more neuroplasticity to be able to make changes within the brain with repetition, and then changing the motor patterns to optimize our uh, optimize our movements, our and, and optimize our locomotor system. So DNS has only moved us forward, and so that now it's an extension of what Voita was doing from um, a movement pattern and a neurofacilitory pattern by taking it into motion, mm -hmm. into movement. I, you know, I was the one as a, one of the initial um, instructors, international instructors. I was the one who recommended the name dynamic neuromuscular stabilization to Pavel because he was looking for a name, and he liked that, and so that is stuck. And I think that it really helps to perfectly explain what it is we're trying to do. And I also suggest a, the, a, um, that they use the term um, motor control for life, mm -hmm. which they liked, and which has been also integrated. Uh, and I think that this is what we're talking about with, with DNS. The strengths are that, and, and the fact uh, that it promotes uh, independence. If you understand and own and take responsibility for the uh, uh, for the movement, for the posture, mm -hmm. for the uh, for the breathing, mm -hmm. then what you're doing is you're exercising all through the day, and you're you you will have then motor control through life. Of course, we have accidents, we have other things that can come up where we need more uh, more assistance from a professional, but uh, the but the fact is it's an optimal goal, it's an optimal strategy for a more independent lifestyle with less pain and greater. Um, ability for body control. Five years ago, about, uh, DNS removed reflex locomotion from the coursework. So there's there's good and bad with that. So right. what's been the fallout of it being taken out? Do you think that um, it's a problem that it's not in there? Are students missing out by not understanding like the general principles of reflex locomotion? Um, I think that it's it would be bad for people for the students if they go later in on somewhere to be have that exposed to mm -hmm. them, um, so that they under so that they do understand it. But I think it's almost it's I think that the uh, the separation is a natural expansion because there's too much material. It's just like you have specialties within medicine, and because there's too much too much information to manage it all, and so you have specialties. So there's a good chance, but the the challenge right now is to expose um, more of the world to reflex locomotion, so that they understand what a critical um, uh, tool it is. I my I have a very diverse practice, so my I I, I see patients with from pediatrics with um, uh, delayed or, or faulty motor control issues to post traumatic uh, brain um, trauma and to degenerative neurological diseases. So I use I still use reflex locomotion daily in my practice, mm -hmm. um, but um, but I use you know the reflex locomotion or the DNS exercises as part of my practice on a daily basis. So I think there's room for both. I'd like to see that make sure that Voita's work continues to have a chance to grow around the world because I think it's the most effective neurofacilitatory technique, especially uh, following uh, brain trauma. Um, and, and also, I have had some patients now that have had neuro, degenerative uh, neurological disorders, and we have extended their ability to remain bipedal, to mean and 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 their functional capacity, uh, what we believe is by years. So you can by by integrating these, and it's more. It's not only reflex locomotion. Not only um, DNS. We're also integrating a multimodal approach for nutrition and also for acupuncture. 
um, and uh, some uh, hand therapy, mm. occupational therapy. So what I'm saying is we still have moving to the for, for you guys, you younger guys, for the future, the idea of keeping it broader, keeping it all open, but then keeping it open for more and greater integration and proving how these, uh, you know, the, Guys like me now we're becoming dinosaurs, and but the, the, what's important is not that we are. What's important is that whatever our we were taught, we're able to hand off, and any new ideas that we think that are of value can be also handed off, which is the most important part of today's discussion for me. Right. Well, I think too. I mean, I always say it this way. I feel like because reflex locomotion is out of DNS curriculum right now, we probably have less people that are extraordinary at DNS, but we have more people that are able to apply DNS overall in a better way by taking that material out. So it's probably a little bit of a trade-off. I think that's right. Yeah. Um, speaking of 2K19, I think you put on one of the best seminars ever as far as like an, an overreaching seminar that just had a bunch of the right people there. And the other thing you did is you brought uh, Paul Hodges out of his hole from Australia. So a lot of people that, you know, I've never had a chance to hear Paul talk and you and I have talked a lot about, I mean, this is the most researched human being that has ever, you know, put two feet on this planet. So can you talk about your, your time with uh, Dr. Hodges and his big influences and uh, I don't know, maybe a recap of the symposium, like what you thought the, the people that attended got from it. Well, great. I, um, so I envisioned um, the 2K19 to be a um, meeting of the minds of, from three, three houses, three camps. So we'd had the Prague School with Pavel and uh, Kolaj and Elena Kobasova coming. And, you know, and she's a neurologist. And it's very important that I felt we had a neurologist in the program. And and then I also brought um, the work of uh, the Stecco family with Ca Professor Carla Stecco coming with uh, fascial manipulation and her research, which is absolutely brilliant. And then, I, but I really wanted to, you know, I my I, I w wanted to do the conference to bring to have a conference with Pavel and Paul Hodges, mm -hmm. and that would, for me I wouldn't have probably done the conference at all if I couldn't get Paul, Paul Hodges to come mm -hmm. and join us. I felt like they needed to meet and they needed to be together and they needed to talk about what where they their ideas where they are where they think where they together and where they're separate. So Paul I met Paul Hodges through Yanda because um, when I was writing uh, organizing my textbook I wanted a chapter on motor control and I thought he would recommend somebody in Prague and. Instead, he recommended Paul, who was a young PhD at that point, but doing, but it followed um, Yonda's work um, uh, uh, in with poly EMG studies for motor control and a lot of his early work, um, a lot of his early work uh, for a number of years was essentially just confirming Yonda's theories and observations. And um, so I wanted, but then now he has expanded so much and become a, a, a celebrity in the rehab world, as has uh, Pavel Kolaj. And um, he's had, at that point, going into the 2K19 Congress, he had over 500 publications, I believe, and he had over 30,000. When I first interviewed him, for the Congress, he had over 25,000 citations. By the time we had the Congress, he was he had surpassed 30,000. So it means if you have uh, a paper on the low back published, odds are at least one of his papers it's, uh, are included because uh, he's, it's, it's just routinely utilized. This is the impact that he and the Brisbane School have. And again, that all started, that whole, uh, his, all of his work and everything started from Yonda going to, in, to, in 1980, going to New Zealand to <clears throat> um, a joint conference as a keynote speaker with the Australian and New Zealand Physiotherapy Associations. And it was his, that what started all of, what, of Hodges and that whole line of work which changed the world of physiotherapy into becoming much more functional and centrally based neurologically based thanks to him yeah. so um, uh, with regard to the Congress I thought it was uh, it was a great success we had a good a big crowd we had a nice international crowd that attended and the idea was what really started was the big question was is there more to um, the ab abdomen abdominal wall, transverse abdominus, as far as ways to facilitate 
um, uh, intra-abdominal pressurization and stabilization than only um, contracting the transversus. But more than just that, because what we really talked about also was not just, when we talk about contracting, we have to remember that there's, um, uh, there's concentric, eccentric, and isometric contraction of the transversus. And and so uh, what we see with what Pavel is promoting is that there's a lot of eccentric activation of, of the transversus. And we really, and Pavel, Paul said he didn't really know because he'd only been doing act, concentric activation. I think that was the highlight of the, <coughs> the weekend for me when he, yes. when Paul said that. Because what I always say about Paul Hodges, whenever I read his book and I've read them all, that it is the verbiage is exactly right, but then we there's a difference in like how Paul would treat a patient, and you and I would treat a patient. I think like then there's a little bit of a not a breakdown, just a difference. But when I look at the way he puts his words together, I, it just describes DNS perfect. I, I honestly like his terminology better. Like I like I like the the term inner unit and outer unit. I think it's yes. a little. Uh, it's an easier term to digest, whereas like intra-abdominal pressure, people are confusing like an isometric brace with intra-abdominal pressure, and yes. it creates a little bit of confusion. Even yes. though I mean we all know what it is, but unfortunately, like as a if you're younger, you know th th there's a lexicon problem. Like you know there what is. we're calling it is confusing, yes. and uh, so I, I really like the, the terms that he used, and then his pictures. I mean everything is just I thought really well done. Hey, he's, he's he's genius. He's brilliant. Yeah, he is. Yeah, and um, so that's as I felt as though we had three geniuses there up there with uh, Professor um, uh, Stecco and also obviously with Paul Collage. So we had three up there, really forward thinkers, mm -hmm. and I think the idea of also just the integration because you know I first heard about the fascial system and its functional importance at in the Prague School. Um, and they, because they talked about, uh, because again, they're neurologists, and they said, you know, there's tensions, and that's the fascia is what connects our whole body. Mm. Everything else is segmented, but not the fascia. So I heard that back in the 90s. So <clears throat> when I started listening to what Carlos was talking about, uh, this contiguous system also, for me, it was, yeah. I mean, I know I've done that for a long time, and I, she and I had nice talks about what I had learned before, and then now what she's added on. Because what they've added on has been this been oh well, it's changed the entire game on our understanding of the fascial system. It's, it's been a game changer. Yeah, she completely opened my eyes that yes. I didn't have a bad interpretation of fascial manipulation before them, but after seeing her presentation and we had many awesome conversations with you, like at dinner and stuff like that, and I think I realized that as time goes on in in my journey, I've gotta add that to my, there, there's a patient that exists that needs that treatment, and if you don't have that tool, then it's not that you can't help them, but you know, that would be a helpful tool for certain cases. In the pre-Congress, which I thought was really cool, for those of you who don't know, this seminar that, that Craig put on, there was a pre-Congress, and then I was part of the pre-Congress also, where we had uh, the Dodgers represented and the Cubs. And those two teams are heavily integrating DNS in with Stecco's work. So I thought that was really interesting to have, you know, the, the, those two teams there kind of talking about how they integrate the, the multimodal approach. I think it's great. This is, and this is where it's going. I was uh, very fortunate to have a chance to interview both, both Neil uh, from the Dodgers and uh, PJ mm. uh, from the, the Cubs. And, but Neil was the first one. He really explained how <clears throat> multimodal today's um, trainers are in baseball and how um, it's a different day. I, I worked with the NHL uh, around 1999 beginning and for several years, but you know, and we had a number of specialists teaming together, but that's nothing like now. Now it it is a really complex mishmash of integration of specialists, and, and I think that the, the head trainers, all they're doing is act, working as coordinators, largely, to just <clears throat> get the right people together for the right case and the, the right uh, athlete, because each one has its own really customized model of care and strategy and training and all that. Mm -hmm. It's very, very different than back then. Mm -hmm. that changed. You have a very underrated textbook that's out. So um, I, I tell anyone who listen. We uh, obviously Craig Levinson's book was uh, instrumental. Your book is yes. uh, you know also just yep. and they're different. They're they're just you yeah. know they're not the same book. 
Um, can you explain the heartaches of putting that book together? Well, first I would just say <clears throat> the reason that I wrote the book and, and my, my audience was actually chiropractic and physiotherapy students because in America, the doctorate for physical, th phys physical therapy was in process. And so I wanted the, the chiros and physios to know how to manage oh, and all the options available uh, in clinical practice and what are the standards of practice. So that was essentially who I wrote the book for. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of wanted people to understand that, uh, especially chiropractors need to understand that in our world, you know, we consider ourselves uh, spine experts. But in the medical world, the rest of the world, we're not. Because instead, what we're seen as is manipulation experts. Mm -hmm. And for us, and generally, if you have somebody who is an expert in a field, <clears throat> that means they have in-depth knowledge of all aspects of the field. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so to me, uh, chiropractors need to really understand what are the current standards of, for surgery. What's the terminology and for pain management mm -hmm. and for uh, neurodiagnostics and imaging? And we have to have and understand all aspects. And by doing that, we also need to have contacts within our region so that we can be a true resource to our community mm -hmm. by having the best people and that you can communicate with them because you've already established a relationship. It's one thing if there's a neurosurgeon or orthopedic spine surgeon in town who you know is good that you can send to. It's another if you have some specific concerns <clears throat> that you can discuss with them or you can or the, you can go in and observe them during surgery and uh, understand what they're doing and why they're doing it. Um, so for me, my book was designed, and it's still designed, and there's still people still, it's now, uh, it was 2006 text, but it's still being purchased. Um, I know that because I still get checks. Quit splashing the cash around here, will you? From McGraw-Hill, and so it's, um, uh, they still uh, look for that, and I think it's still used as a model for interprofessional um, communication management. What was your uh, favorite chapter in that book? My you, favorite, my favorite, my favorite chapter in the book was the um, functional assessment chapter, and the reason was because uh, Yanda passed away in November two thousand two when we were in the midst of you know of, of compiling everything. I started in ninety nine, late ninety nine, and then it came out in early 2006. And so he passed away and we had only started to to uh, um, scope out that chapter, what we were going to talk about in that chapter, started on it, but then he passed away and he, and he passed away, he had been ill for a while, but then he passed away suddenly. So we thought he had at least, an, uh, he was ill and we thought he had another six months to a year to, to live. And um, so when he passed away suddenly, I my chapter that was supposed to be, I think it was about 25 pages or something like that, I was worried that I was going to forget something <laughs> uh, with time. And so that chapter was my opportunity to try to write everything I could think of at that time into that chapter. And so it ended up being, I think, about a 70-page chapter. Uh, so that means it was, uh, you know, it's three pages written on a, on a regular page to one page in a book. And so, so it was, over, I, the manuscript I wrote was well over 200 pages when I, when I finished it. And so I just thought, you know, uh, thank God for him. And I, I, I felt a huge uh, burden to do my best to write everything I could out. Uh, while it was fresh, while he was still this close with me, because uh, that I didn't lose that because uh, we would, I'd never had that chance again. Mm -hmm. So that chapter is my favorite chapter. It's the one, most meaningful one. Although there was another one that I was talking with Len cause that he that he helped with. We talked about the other night together because, um, it, and that and that was the chapter that was Yonder's idea. And his idea was, he says, you know, what, I, the, what I'd like is a chapter that I've never read, but I've always wanted to see. He said, we, you know, we have these different schools of thought in manual medicine, like osteopaths and chiropractors, manual medicine, and physiotherapy, but we never get a group coming together to write a chapter together on what we agree on and our common approaches. Or, or, or a common vision and different approaches to the same thing. Mm. So he says, I'd really love to do a chapter like that. I said, 
let's do it. Well, that's a brilliant idea. So we got then Phil Greenman, the great, uh, late great osteopath, who was a close friend from, he was from Michigan State, and he was a very close friend with Yonda, and they were the same age and known each other for decades. <coughs> and uh, and uh, then uh, I was involved. Uh, oh, and I wanted Len, and wanted Len Fay. So Len agreed and was very happy to do it and very excited to be a part of it also. But then Yonda passed away before it was finished. So then I invited Don Murphy, um, my brilliant, uh, brilliant friend and colleague, um, who wrote the sister text to my book and before me, the, the cervical spine book. And, um, and so we all took it on together and tried to fill in the rest uh, you know, it's not so easy trying to replace Vladimir Yonda, so <laughs> we took multiple people trying to take it together to gird our lo gird our loins and 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 and, and take up the, sh the the shields and 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 try and try and pull it off. And I think it came out to be a good chapter, interesting chapter. Yeah. Well, I would give the whole book a five star review. So I always recommend people always you know of course want to know like what books you know do you recommend for somebody who's wanting to learn about the contemporary chiropractor and i think that book is definitely you know it's right there so well you thank you it yeah. was a you know for me you know uh you know who wouldn't want if you're really interested and in, <clears throat> academically interested and in, in understanding um for example low back syndromes low back disorders to have the opportunity to have the greatest minds in the spine world all right for you then you get to edit them, and with that, you get to ask more questions. <laughs> and so, you know, it's a very, very lonely experience organizing a book like that. But at the same time, from an intellectual and academic standpoint, the growth and the opportunities to then communicate with, you know, Yonda and Bogduck and Vert Mooney, for those who remember the late, great Vert Mooney, the great spine surgeon, and... Um, uh, and Paul Hodges, and, and then have the great, late great, probably the, the, the most well-known spine surgeon as a leader in the spine world of the 20th century was was Kirk Aldi Willis, and you know, and he he wrote the intro for me. Mm -hmm. So I was, and I, I was very, I felt very fortunate, and I had uh, the, the, more of the greatest physios, chiros. And I just, I just had a, it was a, a, a chance to get to meet and know and work together, collaborate with the greatest minds in the spine world so it was an incredible experience it's uh kind of interesting to see the the lineage i know one of my big mentors was clayton skaggs in st yeah. louis and yes. uh he tells a story of uh you know he was a little bit lost in practice so he gets this flyer that uh vladimir yonda is going to be in peoria illinois like the in two weeks or whatever he'd never heard of yonda so he's like well hell i need ces i'm just gonna you know show up for the weekend and then like that was his moment of you know and then maybe who was in the original group obviously i know clayton and uh, craig liebenson you oh great question so this was this was a great group so uh claire frank who's a very well known, very well established leading phys yeah, physical great. physical therapist and, an, and a DNS instructor, original instructor also, like I am. We had <clears throat> um, we had Dick Earhart, Richard Earhart, who was a DC PT from University of Pittsburgh, who was there. We had um, uh, we was had, Robert in the original one, Lardner? Not, no, not the original one. Okay. We, we had Jerry Hyman, who yeah. he and John Hannon, both TCs, both brilliant, both mentors to me. Um, and they worked initially uh, as a trio along with Craig Liebenson in the early days to get things established. Jerry Hyman was the first, um, along with Ron LaFay, up at Western States to go to Prague to study, and he was invited by Yonda to go study, so they went together to study with him. They were the first ones ever to go over, and um, yeah, to my knowledge, I think that's right, at least to Yonda. There's a good chance Craig may have gone over and invited by, by uh, Levitt, I'm not sure. And um, so we had... Um, uh, Peter DeFranco, um, who is, um, uh, no, that's, that's wrong. Sorry. I'm trying to think who the other guys were. There were so many. Oh, well, Don Murphy. Yeah. And Clayton. Stick Kags. Um, we had Sue Green, who's a chiropractor in San Francisco. We had, um, I have to 
I think that's a, that, <laughs> such a good group. We'll, put, we'll put it in the show notes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, that's a great group. But anyways, you go ahead. No, I was just going to say, uh, you know, integration, I think, was a, is, is a key thing that we talk about in every single one of our podcasts and the thing that we're trying to, to push it on. And so I had, I just thank you for bringing Vlad's work and and you know he was without the Prague School I mean where would we be without Vlad and, and Levitt and those guys so it's pretty amazing we're we're trying to push on that that integration piece so and your book did that which uh, which is pretty awesome thank you so much yeah so anything else to, to finish with Brett you got any other burning questions no I think that's I mean I think we accomplished what I wanted which is I think like the younger generation needs to know like how we've gotten to this point. Because, and you're a historian, like I know Taylor is and myself, if you know the history, then you can understand where the ship's going a lot easier, you know? And uh, I think sometimes, like, people just, they skirt over the history, so they don't know, you know, where the, where the vision is going. And, and speaking of that, uh, you have a son who's at Logan right now, and he's about to start his preceptorship in, uh, at our office in St. Louis, so that'll be next week, so we're kind of excited about that. What is the, what is the future of the profession do you think what what are you telling your your son what's uh words of advice well i think uh, as we mentioned the other night at dinner <clears throat> the, the old books tell us that there's a lot of stuff that's not new but it's just being reformulated mm -hmm. repackaged yeah. and uh which surprised me when i looked at those old books and became more intrigued and so the same things that brought chiropractic if we're talking about just the chiropractic profession then, <clears throat> then um, are the same things that it ha must require to continue. So we're people, people. We took we take the time to listen. We we take the time to be human and, and with each patient. And it's our it, and we have our it's hands on. And so now we have the opportunity. We have the knowledge coming from all. Uh, from all different groups now in different parts of the world that nobody has ever had that before. And we, now we have it all coming in. Now we have young guys like you who are now also interested. What you guys are doing at these podcasts, are, I think, are fantastic yeah. because they're really giving um, a, ch a chance for history and t integration. And, uh, you know, so my son now, he'll graduate. Uh, uh, he's scheduled to graduate in December from Logan, my son Christopher. And, <clears throat> and um, you know, the idea is that you guys are continuing to add stuff. You guys go move past us. And this is what we want for our children also. We want whatever we do in our life, we want our children to have a, that, that much greater, that yeah. much better experience, that much more success, that much more fun, whatever. And so it's the same thing we want. And we really need that mm -hmm. because when we look at this, the, like the World Health Organization is, um, is talking about the, the upcoming demands for a management of human suffering on a global scale and a, and a growing a growing population, then we have to, as a pro as a profession, accept our responsibility as part of that, mm -hmm. and not as any kind of an isolated group, but a more integral approach to thinking. So that probably was a, uh, kind of a point of my book, mm -hmm. and it's a part of what you guys. I know, Brett, you have a multidisciplinary clinic that that you oversee that you guys work at, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> and so it's the same thing that. Where we use, continue to use our strengths, and we continue to grow, but we must maintain the basic standards for our human interaction, our human, our humanity within our practice. Because, um, and this was what the Prague School was also very worried about: is that we become too technically established and too technical in our approach, and so we can read the MRI and what it says, but we can't go and do a proper palpatory assessment. Mm -hmm. We can't give the optim optimal history. We are not taking the time to listen because of time constraints and different things like that, and it's becoming too technical. And this was a big concern, and this is certainly a huge concern of Professor Levitt's. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have to make sure that we continue to maintain our palpatory, liter palpatory literacy, mm -hmm. palpatory clinical literacy for what, you know, so that you can, we, we, we can uh, have the ability to feel where the, where the faults lie. We have the ability to find out where we have normal and normal tense of tissue. And we have to remember, D.D. Palmer said in his book, Ch chiropractic is based, it's not on based on subluxation, it's not based on, it's based on the tone of the tissue. 
in his book, in his 1914 book, um, um, called The Chiropractor. And so we have to be able to maintain our visual and our clinic and our palpatory skills in a, long, when, in a time when the technologies want to make it easier and give us a, a quicker, easier way out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I did have actually one more question sure. before we wrap it up. Sure. Uh, what was Voita <laughs> and Yanda's relationship? Um, their relationship was close. Um, uh, Vo Yanda was very sad because when Voita, uh, Yanda was sad, very sad when Voita passed away. Um, he admired him greatly. Um, Voita was a, a very religious man. He was Catholic. So he always hated um, communism and being in a communist country. And, um, but he was absolutely fascinated by Voita's work and his contribution to developmental kinesiology within the Prague School. So if you look at the Prague School, you can look at Levitt as doing the manual techniques and the assessment. You can look at Voita as integrating developmental kinesiology aspects um, into, and, to, and 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 uh, locomotor system maturation, and then and 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 then you look at Yanda looking at the motor motor control aspects, muscle imbalances, postural imbalances, movement patterns. So they each they each fit together and form this 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 perfect trio. And so Yanda ab admired the genius of Voita, um, um, and he thought the world of Voita. He, he he admired him so, and his the depth of his of his character and the depth of because he escaped, you know, um, Voita escaped in '68 when they had the Prague Spring. He was down in in Italy in Rome, which is where he initially established his first Voita school uh, institute outside was in Rome, and that's why his book is also published in Italian. Started there, and then he immigrated to Germany after that, and where his final institute was, and he really grew from there. And so he left because of the Prague Spring in '68, and so as a result, their collaboration then was more distant after that uh, for a time because of the times uh, after the Prague Spring in '68. Then Czechoslovakia became extremely closed down for a number of years. Um, after after the, that, and so there was little communication for a number of years until things released relaxed again, and then he was a, they were able to collaborate more and be more in touch. Was Voita equally enamored with Yanda? Also, it was like a mutual. Why well, you know I never met Voita. I think Pavel would be better to discuss that. As far as I know, yes, I think Voita was extremely, you know, that this is, well, I'm glad you asked this question. The greatest lesson for, for professional collaboration in my almost 40 years now was, and what the people from those first three years that we went together as a group, so Robert was in, I think, the second and third year. I went the first and I went the third year, was the debates, the Yonda Levitt debates. This was, <coughs> this changed, um, this was a game changer for me because they, these were two geniuses and they had a lot of things they disagreed on. And their debates, be, and they were brilliant in their debates. But every now and then, one of them would have make a point that hadn't been discussed before in their in their discussions. And when it was brought up, if it was a good point and it was enough, it was a game changer. Then the other one would immediately say, uh, uh, "You know what? You're right. Now I agree with you. I never thought of that." And they would change their perspective immediately. So the point was. And the lesson was, for me, the great lesson, was that they had no interest in winning. Hmm. And it's something you heard me say at the Congress, I'm not interested in being right. I'm interested in getting it right. Mm -hmm. And this is what we need. I think chiropractic profession still is very much in, a, in its adolescence from a, its intellectual growth standpoint because everybody's too busy. If they're going to have any kind of debate or disagreement, their focus is going to be to win. Hmm. But instead, the lesson from Levitt and Yonda was to the, the win is in the growth. The, the win is in the getting it right the, and in the respect for each other, the, the mutual respect for each other that's shown as they debate. They would hold, they would stubborn, not stubbornly, they would, they would hold uh, strongly to their different perspective. And there was no budging them unless you came up 
with a better argument, and if you did, then boom, then they let go immediately, and there was, it was nothing. There, you, there was no, and we all could learn from that kind of openness, that type of, that kind of pragmatism, because I believe. You're, this is the answer to your question with Voita, with Yana, with Levitt, with Bele, with uh, the others. Um, and Professor Chihok, who I should mention, the, the, who was their anatomy instructor for all of them, and was unbelievable, and changed all of our thoughts in neurology, by the way, if you're interested. Um, he, um, they, this is how they grew. This is what made the Prague School what it was. It was their ability to learn together and grow together because they were all looking in search of the truth, mm-hmm. not in the search of winning. Yeah, no, so that's good. a really good... Craig may or may not be sitting on hours of raw footage of Yonda. It's uh, hidden under his mattress, maybe, uh, <laughs> back home. So I'm still working on getting that out of, out of Craig. But uh, yeah. but anyways, that's a great job. I yeah. really appreciate the... You did a great job. It was a great history lesson, especially for me. So thank you for that. And then two, I think just to sum it up is is you made the perfect point of keeping the pursuit of knowledge and uh, not necessarily trying to win, but uh, try, trying to do what's best for the person in front of us and uh, keep moving the profession forward one day at a time, integrating with people that are smarter than you, yeah. uh, integrating with people that uh, you can learn from, and uh, you know we, you can always learn something from somebody. So I definitely learned something today. So Craig, thank you so much for letting us hang out in your practice and uh, entertaining us and. Uh, uh, I'm sure we'll be back and have another conversation with you at some point. So my, my pleasure. Thank you guys. All right. See ya. All right, guys.